On behalf of all assembled here today, I should now like to invite our newest alumni, Dr. James Temerty and Dr. Louise Temerty, to address convocation. Thank you, Dr. Michael Strong, for that wonderful introduction. Chancellor Cowan, President Chakma, faculty members, graduates, and your families, distinguished guests. We are both deeply grateful and honored to be receiving these honorary docs, especially since we have an association with Western University. For one thing, we have been philanthropically involved with the Schulich School of Medicine's neurodegenerative research program for many years. We believe strongly in the work being done here, and we are proud to be playing a part in the progress that is being made. And also, our daughter Leah and her husband Michael Lord attended Western University. And I might add, uh, since our dear friend uh, Frank Hasenfratz and uh, Monica Spey are sitting in front of us, uh, their, their daughter, Linda Hasenfratz, uh, graduated from Ivy with an MBA. And do you have any grandkids uh, here? Uh, here? Four? Fantastic. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's another reason for us to be delighted to be receiving these honorary docs uh, today. Okay. We are standing here in front of a wide range of graduates across different faculties. What you all have in common is that you have chosen a specialty that matters to you. You have worked hard toward academic achievement that reflects both your values and passion. As two people who are deeply committed to our own values, we respect the path you've taken and are honored to be here speaking to you today. Louise and I have uh, chosen four things to focus on, drawn from our own experiences in life and um, in our careers. One of them is a value of compromise. The other is a role of intuition. We want to speak about the importance of uh, perseverance and the nature of opportunity. I will start by talking today about the importance of compromise. If you search the word compromise, you will find many interpretations along the line of never give in. It's more like give and take. He gives, I take. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's not what we mean by compromise. Compromise is listening to each other Compromise has been a theme throughout our 50 years together. One time, Jim wanted a boat, and I get very seasick on a boat. Finally, he got his boat, and he knew I was very nervous about it. Let's compromise, he said. You named the boat. So I said, no problem. We'll call it for sale. <laughs> See, compromise is understanding the other person's point of view, not necessarily agreeing, but recognizing his value and reaching for a win-win. Now about intuition. So you can imagine that after leaving the uh, comfortable and exciting career of um, working for IBM for 15 years, not everyone thought it was a great idea. I received all kinds of advice, be both before and um, after I decided on entrepreneurial path. My father said, don't do it. Even my dentist, while he had me trapped in, in the dentist chair, <laughs> said I was, uh, I was, I was mad. Um, and I was getting so much advice, it came to a point where I developed a kind of a, a motto. Um, and, and the motto became, seek everyone's counsel, but follow your own. In other words, trust your intuition. 
Tim Cook, the chief executive officer of um, Apple, likes to say, trust your intuition, but work like hell to make sure that it happens. Exactly, but first, you have to inform your intuition, which I call seeking everyone's counsel. And that involves the very hard work of talking to people, reading books, periodicals, reports, Googling at length, and uh, networking. Sometimes you will get advice on a particular course of action that may resonate with you, but be very careful before taking that advice. Chances are those giving that advice don't have the same commitment that you do and may not be seeing the entire picture. What are you going to do in the middle of the uh, process? Um, run back and say, what do I do now? So you have to make it your own. Let me tell you about a couple of inst instances where I didn't follow advice. I sought counsel, but followed my own intuition. Before launching Northland Power, I um, asked a trusted consultant named Tony Anderson to review my business plan. Tony came back to me and advised that I not start Northland Power. I listened, but I chose instead to start the company. And one year later, I hired Tony Anderson. He became my chief financial officer and stayed with us for 25 years before retiring. And today, Northland Power is a public company with a total enterprise value exceeding well over $10 billion. The early years of Northland Power were fraught with various challenges. I recall meeting with a senior bank executive who was very irate. We were reviewing my financial position in one of the plants that we were building, and we were, quite frankly, in a very serious jam. He wasn't amused, and he gave me the following advice. He said, if I were you, I would jump out that window. <laughs> my intuition was to stay put. <laughs> so read the books, do the research, lay the groundwork, seek counsel. In other words, inform your intuition before you act on it so that you can be confident in your course of action. Because when you believe in yourself and come to trust your intuition, you are more likely to stand up and seize the moment and to persevere long after others might have given up. And this is where the importance of perseverance comes in. Winston Churchill once said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Inevitably, you will be challenged with your own versions of going through hell. And to survive it, you will need to persevere. Perseverance has served Airbnb very well. Two years into their business, they had revenues of just a couple of hundred dollars a week. Perseverance is the guiding principle of Apple. They were virtually bankrupt in 1997, and look at them today. It took James Dyson five years and over 5,000 failed prototypes to develop the world's first bagless vacuum cleaner. Ten years later, he set up his own manufacturing facility because nobody else would manufacture the product. These now highly successful companies had to persevere through some tough times. In Northland's case, both of our first two projects nearly failed. You heard about one of them when I decided not to jump out the window, but let me tell you about the, the very first uh, crisis. Soon after we had started Northland Power and were building our very first project, a small 10 megawatt biomass-fired uh, uh, power plant, we realized that we had probably uh, miscalculated the economics and we would have to do something quite drastic to save the situation. We decided that the course of action would call for us to greatly expand the size of the plant, take it from 10 megawatts to 35 uh, megawatts. First of all, I had to convince Ontario Hydro to take uh, power from this much larger plant and uh, with most of it fired by a gas turbine. Well, they didn't have a policy or a practice to accommodate uh, such a thing, but I persevered, and we kept after Ontario Hydro, and finally the board uh, decided to take a chance and let us, have, let us have a contract that would allow us to take the plant to 35 uh, megawatts. But we didn't have the gas to make 35 megawatts uh, work. We had to buy the gas, and we had to buy the gas in such a way that the price of the gas would be tied lockstep with the electricity for the ensuing 20 years in order for, for the project to be financeable. So I started traveling every week to Saskatchewan and Alberta, 
calling on oil and gas companies, and I cold, cold called on 63 oil and gas companies. And I remember visiting with the uh, president of the Petroleum Club of, uh, of Alberta, who is virtually the king of Alberta, and he said to me, young man, I was a young guy uh, at the time, young man, uh, this will never work, get out of town. But I, I continued, and finally the 63rd company, a company called Methon, agreed to provide us with that uh, gas. And um, that project went on to be very profitable for us for uh, the many years uh, thereafter. This crisis always reminds me of the wisdom of the Chinese. Their term for crisis consists of two symbols, one representing great danger and the other opportunity. Now, about opportunity. Opportunity is something that does not just happen like some random luck break. You have to work for it. You have to prepare for it. There's a saying that I'm sure you'll all heard. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. So how do you prepare for opportunity? Well, you're already doing it by studying, developing curiosity about things, engaging with people, networking, going to conferences, exhibitions, workshops, and trade shows, and by being alert to your opportunity. In our own case, our first business venture was Computerland. And it started because Jim was curious about a store opening that he was invited to in 1979. He went and became fascinated in the potential of personal computing long before there was an IBM personal computer and VisiCalc. And that curiosity led to 30 Computerland stores. Jim was not the only one invited to that store opening. Many of our peers and colleagues were, but he was the only one who showed up. And Northland Power would not have happened had we not attended an engineering, an engineering ball, and he's not even an engineer. He met some engineer there who years later called to say, we understand you have some time and some money after having sold computer land. How would you like to build a power plant? We were curious about what they were proposing. What started as a 15 million project is now a company building billion dollars wind farms offshore in Europe. Another startup that we were involved with, Soft Choice, came about because we saw an opportunity to sell software in a new way. And Soft Choice became a company doing a billion dollars in sale. When opportunity shines, what kind of people will jump for it? Well, these people People are typically energetic, they study, and they are endlessly curious. They are creative, they can focus, and they are interested in people. They network, they never stop learning, and they stay alert for their opportunity. So we've talked about um, the value of compromise, the role of intuition, persevering through thick and thin, and about seizing opportunity. But we haven't yet talked about one of the most important things that have guided us through our lives, and that's giving back. We always believe in giving back to those around us at home, in the community, and to share what we have. There are different ways to give back. One is donate money, of course, but the best way to give is your time. And giving your time really means giving of yourself. And we are so often in admiration of people who devote time and energy to volunteer causes. Remember, you make a living by getting, and you make a life by giving. So, graduates, uh, let us close by urging you with a quotation from uh, Goethe. Goethe wrote, whatever you can do or dream, begin it. Boldness has genius power, and magic in it. So graduates, a hearty congratulations for what you have accomplished. And I, Louise and I wish you great success in your careers and your life as you put into practice the lessons of the last years and continue the process of building an even greater Canada. Be bold, dream, begin. Thank you. Thank you.